Good evening and welcome. My name is John Thornhill. I'm the innovation editor and tech columnist at the Financial Times and a former Asia editor. And it's an enormous pleasure to co-host this evening's event. We are going to have a full and frank discussion about a subject of global interest, the development of India's tech stack. And we're fortunate to have one of the main architects of the Indian tech stack and the co-founder and chairman of Infosys, Nanda Nilikani, to talk about it here tonight. So I'm going to interview him on stage in a little bit, and then we're all gonna give you a chance to ask questions as well. Uh, before we go any further, I would, on behalf of all of us at the Financial Times, I would also like to express my sincere th sympathy and condolences for the terrible train crash in Odisha that claimed so many lives. And I would also like to express my thanks uh, to His Excellency Vikram Daraswamy, uh, our host this evening from the High Commission. Uh, thank you very much for hosting us and in this wonderful room tonight. So, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, John, for that uh, introduction to the evening's proceedings. A warm welcome to one of the most admired persons, at least as far as I'm concerned, and certainly from my co colleagues here in the High Commission, Nandan Nilekani and his better half, Rohini. A warm welcome to all of you to uh, India House, and thank you indeed, Financial Times, for partnering us on this event. This is, of course, the first time we've done anything like this, so we're very grateful to each one of you for coming in. Uh, I'm sure there'll be many little niggles that we'll figure out. For instance, the absence of air conditioning might well be felt <laughs> at some point of time, but you could pass it on to the warmth of our hospitality. Uh, we also look forward to this conversation, and I think uh, one of the things I did want to say is to position this conversation, first of all, as an answer to the question of why are we meeting on this topic? Um, from a layman's perspective, and in my case, it is very much uh, an appropriate description, uh, I see the idea of uh, DPIs as being the equivalent of the 19th century infrastructure, 19th and 20th century infrastructure that all our countries built, some with varying degrees of success. Uh, Achim Steiner, the UNDP administrator, in fact, actually described DPIs as the 21st century version of roads, bridges, and railways. The lovely part about it is, if you take that analogy further, is that the road is agnostic uh, to what you drive on it. It could be a public bus, it could be cycles, it could be uh, cycle rickshaws, or it could indeed be a Mercedes Benz if you're well off enough. Uh, DPIs essentially will provide us that level of inclusion, which in the Indian context is, has been hugely transformative. If I've left that position a little, a little indistinct, it is only because there is obviously a finer exponent on the subject, but my own, in my own limited understanding, I believe that it is vital for us to appreciate this topic because I think it is transformative and it is potentially a game changer, not just for developing countries, but for the world in, as a whole. And that, in, in fact, is the, is the answer to the second question that I wanted to position here, which is, why are we meeting here in India House? And it isn't only just because we invited you, and it isn't only just because Nandan is from India, but it is because India has, and Nandan has played the key role in that, driven the DPI revolution a number of other countries have done some very interesting things, but what we've achieved has actually started to show huge and significant results. The Indian DPI experience is based on the India stack, which is really three layers, three broad layers. The uh, Aadhaar story, the unique identity story, which if when, when at the pearly gates, when the good deeds are all being totted up, Nandan side of the ledger won't need any further totting up uh, because it has actually changed the lives of literally a billion Indian people. They've become citizens as a result of that. And that is no mean achievement for anybody to say. But it's also because the second layer of it, which is the payment system, has been hugely transformative too. Essentially, at the beginning of this year, India alone did something like 8 billion transactions on, on, on fintech platforms. And essentially, something like 300 million people, 50 million merchants, utilized 
payment platforms which were technology agnostic and therefore like the road that I mentioned as an analogy, didn't really care whether it was uh, Ramu the tailor bringing his money across or whether it was, to use the same analogy, Nandan bringing his money across. And that, again, is the beautiful part of it. It didn't matter what system or who paid. And finally, the third part of it was the uh, bit that is transformative in terms of um, um, the, the sort of larger um, data empowerment piece that goes with uh, the India digital stack. I think it's relevant for all of us because of the significant benefits this will have, not only for, for countries like India, but for the world as a whole. And therefore, my last point, why now? Obviously, the G20 is taking place in India, so it's timely for us to make this point. Uh, this autumn, we will have the summit, and we believe the G20 could be a great forum to drive global integration of digital public infrastructure. Brazil is a leading player and similarly in this. The EU has done some very interesting work. So there is obviously an opportunity there. I also believe that there is, um, uh, that we currently face a challenge and in this particularly uh, vulnerable era of geopolitics and geoeconomics, it probably makes sense for us to look at the next big driver of growth, which DPIs could be leveraging, leveraging digital empowerment and digital inclusion as the next big wave for the world to surf. If all of that works, then we will not be looking at trickle-down theory. We will not be looking at empowerment incrementally through socialism, but through digital empowerment, which could transform the lives of literally billions of human beings. That, say what you will, will be wonderful. And so let me close by welcoming Nandan and by saying, in his words, that what will it need? Of course, it will need money, but as Nandan said, you don't need deep pockets, but deep commitment. Correct? Thank you very much. <laughs> Your Excellency, um, and welcome, Nandan. Thank you, John. Good to see you again. Um, I'd like to talk to you about um, two small accomplishments of yours. Um, transforming the private sector in the world's most populous country, and the second is transforming the public sector in the world's populous country. And I wondered if I could start with the kind of big vision uh, of all of this. Uh, the other day, I was talking to Dame uh, Professor Wendy Hall, uh, who's the Regis Professor of um, compute, computer science at Southampton University, an author of a book called The Four Internets. And in her take on the digital economy, we have had four internets. We have the original libertarian uh, version of the World Wide Web that uh, no one should control this space. We then have the second, which is the kind of US commercial internet, which is you've got the Facebooks and the Googles and the big tech companies dominating it. Uh, you then have the Chinese internet, uh, which is a very controlled um, uh, kind of internet um, with a kind of very strict firewalls. And you have a European internet, which is a regulated bourgeois internet, I think she calls it. <laughs> um, and she told me that if she were writing this book again, she would call it the five internets and include India as a whole separate digital ecosystem. So could you start, is that right? Is India creating something very different from what we are seeing elsewhere in the world at the moment. Oh uh, yeah, well, I'm biased, but I do think so. And uh, the idea is that you know we live in a digital economy, right? Everything we do, our relationships, our ordering food, buying things, learning, meeting friends, everything is done on the internet, especially so in the pandemic. And given the digital intensity of our lives and our economies and our societies. It's important that how, the, how we architect that to become more inclusive or more equitable or to enable more people to participate, that's really very important. And I think what India has done in the last 15 years is to build the building blocks of that kind of an where Digital technology is actually leveraged for not only for economic reasons, but also for social inclusion reasons. So yes, it is a different way of doing things. And I think it deserves its own categorization of a fifth internet. Right. Uh, how did this kind of vision develop? Was it very much kind of organic? It was um, uh, serendipitous? Or was it uh, a group of people at the beginning who were thinking, we need to build this in a different way? No, I, I don't think uh, it was. I think it, so we sort of went from one to the other. And these things, you know, you don't know everything in the beginning. But over 15 years, I think it's all, it's all evolved. And it, it did begin with the ID 
the Aadhaar work, which uh, Vikram also talked about. Is it okay to call you Vikram and not His Excellency and all that? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I joined the government in 2009 and I led the project. And uh, by the time I stepped down in five years, we had reached 600 million people with ID. And then I met Prime Minister Modi. He, he was very enthusiastic. He took it forward. And today, 1.3 billion Indians have the ID. And it's important that it's a digital ID on the cloud. That's, so it's online. And I can do an online verification anywhere in the country in real time. And that does about 80 million authentications a day. So it's really very widely used for all kinds of purposes. So that was one fundamental thing which the foundation of And it was designed to be very simple ID that just confirmed that John is John. And everything else was done by somebody else. And then that led to another capability, which is what you call it, know your customer or electronic know your customer. And the reason that is important is because whether you want to open a bank account, get a mobile connection, buy a mutual fund, you have to prove who you are. And before Aadhaar, several hundred million Indians didn't have any ID whatsoever because in most Western countries, the root ID is the birth certificate. But in India, many children were born who didn't have birth certificates, and therefore they couldn't really progress. So the idea was if everybody has an ID, which they can open a bank account, get a mobile connection, board the train, get a job, show it to the cops if they're stopped, suddenly they are empowered. And I think that that then laid the foundation for many other things. But these were the things that happened. At least uh, some of the people in the audience will know that uh, in this country we have a very high allergy to kind of uh, IDs. Um, yeah. I'm, you... I'm, I'm a bit perplex. <sighs> yeah. This is a country where there are between five to seven million CCTV cameras. There's one, one CCTV camera for every 10, 11 people. And everyone is being recorded on a CCTV camera at least 30 to 40 times a day. And with facial recognition, I know who that person is. So the argument, therefore, that having an ID affects your privacy is, I think, a bit late. Yeah. <coughs> so you have noticed that we British are not always consistent. In our <laughs> and I, you have about 30 million people on TikTok. Indeed. All right. And imagine what that is doing to you. <laughs> we might come back to that, too. But, um, is that, um, but was that an issue that you had to overcome? Was there a kind of civil rights objection to having? No, I mean, uh, obviously there were some people who were genuinely concerned about uh, both privacy as well as, you know, surveillance state and those kind of things. But I think we designed it also to be very simple. So it only says John is John. Now, what John does with it in a bank is in the banking system. When the ID is used in the healthcare system, the record is the hospital. So we call this as a federated infrastructure. And we just did the root ID that confirmed that you are the person you claim to be. And no data is collected about you. Unlike in a big tech company where they're collecting data every time you log on, no, no data is collected about you. So actually, it's very privacy protecting. So I think, but the case went to the Supreme Court. Uh, and it was the second longest running case in the Indian Supreme Court. But finally, a four to one judge bench said that Aadha was uh, you know, within the privacy principles of India. So I think we have put that to bed. Right. Now, as you're saying, that that was the kind of base layer of the whole digital public infrastructure, and people have been building on top of that. Yeah. Uh, so it's now used um, massively for welfare payments. It was used for COVID sure. vaccination passes and so on. Yeah. I'll, um, maybe I'll spend a couple of minutes on that. Of course. Yeah. So what happened was the EYC, or the Electronic Know Your Customer, accelerated the opening of bank accounts. Because earlier, if you didn't have a paperwork, you couldn't even open a bank account. Now you can open a bank account in two minutes electronically. And when Prime Minister Modi came, he launched something called Jandan program, a push to open bank accounts for people. And 700 million people got bank accounts. So in India's financial inclusion went from 20% to 80%, just because you could open bank accounts electronically in real time. And the same thing happened uh, in mobile phones. And uh, Airtel, Geo, all use EKYs to get mobile phone accounts. And so banking penetration and mobile penetration was essentially expedited by the fact that you had electronic KYC. So all this was the infrastructure. But the thesis was that every, if everybody has a bank account, a mobile connection, and a digital ID, then there are the new instruments in the digital world to move ahead. Yeah. Um, but I think I'm right in saying that India doesn't have a data 
protection law at the moment? There's, it, there's no law, it, but there's a good idea to have one. Yeah, of course, of course, there is a law which is under consideration. Then there was a law version in the in the parliament, and then they took it back and they're putting a new version. But in the meantime, the Supreme Court has laid down the principles of privacy very well. Uh, in fact, Justice Chandrachud, who was in town last week, was a key member of the five five judge bench, which took a decision. So I think a lot of the principles have been laid down, if not in law, but through practice. Yeah, okay. So uh, that was the base layer for this. And on top of that, you have now created the kind of unified payments interface, um, which has, as you're saying, kind of led to this uh, extraordinary financial yeah. explosion in India. Um, could you tell us about what the thinking was behind that and what the balance is between the kind of public sector involvement yeah. and the, creating the base infrastructure for this and how you get that to scale. Because as we've seen elsewhere in the world, people can create public digital goods, but the great challenge is how do you scale it when it's a not-for-profit kind of entity? Yeah, so I, th I think the key thing was the way it was architected. It's a real-time, high-value, low-cost payment platform. And it's actually run by a company called National Payment Corporation of India, NPCI which is a regulated body, but built as a non-profit corporation. And we call these, generally this genre of companies as national information utilities. So they're professional companies, professional leaders. They don't make a profit, but they te complex technology platforms. And we have eight of them. This platform, and the money is in your bank account and connected it to all the banks. But the operation of that can be from a consumer app. In other words, you get the reliability and robustness of the banking system, and you get the consumer experience consumer app. You have Google, WhatsApp, you have a phone, a phone pay, which belongs to Walmart, your Paytm. All these people provide very interesting apps on which you do your payments. But behind the scenes, the money is debited to your bank account. And the payment trail is. As uh, Vikram said, it's agnostic. So you and I could be exchanging a payment, and you could be on HDFC Bank, I may be on SBI, you may be on Google, I may be on WhatsApp, and we can do it seamlessly in real time. And that system today does 9 billion transactions a month. 9 billion. Uh, the last time I checked, it was 8 billion. So, so last month, great, the great month great of May was 9. Um, and when I wrote about it a, a while back, um, we had a lot of readers in, uh, underneath my um, article in the FT's um, I pointed out the difference between the volume of transactions in India and the US. People were saying that cannot possibly be right. But do you have a comparable figure for the US recently? Well, uh, I, 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 certainly the India is a significant part of the world's uh, transactions. So it's certainly bigger than the, the US. But also it's also a very low cost payment system. So you know, the, the power of this is the democratization of payments. You have 300 million people who use it. And you have 50 million uh, QR codes at merchants where you can make payments. And just to give you context, in 35 years of independence, we have only had 6 million point of sale machines where you could make payment with a card. In three years, we have 50 million merchants where you can pay with UPI. You can see the acceleration and scale in a matter of three to four years. Um, and this, um, as the uh, Vikram was saying, is. Uh, becoming a model for other people elsewhere to use. I mean, I think already you can use it in Singapore if you're uh, NRI, you can transfer money yeah. to India and so on. But uh, to what extent is it becoming the kind of model for public in? Well, it's obviously uh, one of the uh, offerings from India. NPCI is sort of a company called NPCI Global to take it global. It's three ways. One is acceptance. Like you go to Harrods or you go to Dubai, Lulu Mall, you should be able to pay with UPI, which you can do in Dubai now. Second is cross-border remit. You want to send money from Singapore to India to your family, you can do it in real time today. Third is if a country says, we will build our own UPI. So all these three are in play. And uh, I assume that in the coming years, we'll see more of that. OK. To what extent do you think um, it is going to be dominated by the big players? Um, you've created this infrastructure. As you're saying, it's kind of agnostic as to who um, operates on it. But I think uh, some of the numbers I was looking at, kind of uh, phone pay and Google pay account for over 80% of the share of the UPI transactions between them. Is that a worry for you or is well, it? Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's credit to their marketing and they're creating a very useful app. And, but anybody can, like Paytm is, is there, they're doing well. The other thing now is that you can, you don't need an app. You know, for example, when you order on your Swiggy, which is like Uber Eats or Deliveroo here, 
you can pay inside the Swiggy app, in which case uh, you don't even need to go out. So there are many things happening. Over time, the number of uh, number of people being able to pay will, you know, different. It'll be a much more. It'll be a very competitive market on the consumer side, because the goal is today we are at about nine billion a month. The goal is one billion a day, which is thirty billion transactions a month. So the thirty billion is only going to happen through many many players. Okay. Um, now, uh, your latest project is the kind of open network for digital commerce, um, which is an interoperable commerce scheme that the authorities began testing, I think, in Bangalore last year, didn't they? Um, could you tell us about that? What is the philosophy behind that, and how are the kind of early uh, indications? I think, the, again, the philosophy is that we can unbundle commerce. So I should be able to order from anyone using any app and have anybody deliver it to me. So, like, open up the protocols and so on. Uh, and uh, then th it, also, it also means that it becomes hugely inclusive. So let's say we have several million small retailers. They can join this grid. And I can sit in my house and order my neighborhood store delivered to me directly. I don't need to go through a huge uh, complex you know, interaction. In fact, we are seeing a very good example of that. Uh, phone pay, which is owned by Walmart, has launched something called PIN code, which is for hyperlocal commerce. We're already doing several thousand transactions. And you have a new way of doing mobility where the payment is directly between the consumer and the cab driver. So that, again, is done using these protocols. So I think it's essentially saying if e-commerce is going to be so profound in our lives, is there a way to do it in a much more inclusive and cost-effective manner? And at the moment, um, apart from the um, open network, uh, digital commerce is very much dominated by Amazon and Walmart through Flipkart. Yeah, but they will, they, they'll obviously be very big players and they'll continue to do that and the, the service they give and all is extraordinary. But you also will allow millions of small retailers to join the network. You know, so it just makes it much more inclusive. Yep. How are you going to get the flywheel operating on the kind of open network and getting people to use it? Because you could imagine when people do... Um, start uh, using it, it will take on a momentum of its own. But again, how, how can you... Well, we, we have found with all these uh, digital public infrastructure that it needs great private companies to adopt it, go all in, and build great companies, right? So in the case of banking, we had Paytm, we had the big banks like HDFC, we had many banks came. In the case of the mobile industry, it was Airtel and Geo and all who came in. Uh, so similarly, we think that these companies, when they see the power of this, will invest and once some invest then others will will not will you know they can't afford to fall behind and that's how we create the flywheel you create the sort of competitive intensity and so on um, and what are the what's the kind of broad reaction to how it's going at the moment it's 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 pretty good i mean uh, i think uh, it's still the transaction volumes are not in the scale that we would like but every day i see new interest and uh, uh, i think the key will be delivery because if you can fix delivery, and now what's going to happen is that this model will create dedicated delivery companies. So only do delivery for a living. And they'll optimize themselves because they will have traffic coming from different apps. So it creates a new architecture of how an e-commerce setup looks like. Right. Uh, a mutual friend was showing me uh, how this works on his app. And uh, was showing me that if you wanted to buy a McChicken burger, uh, why anyone would want to in India, I'm not quite sure, it would cost them 200 82 rupees on Swiggy or Zomato, and at the moment only 109 on uh, ONDC, um, which suggests that there's quite a lot of kind of price subsidization or there's a yeah, lot of... I don't want to go by these prices because, as you said, we don't know who's underwriting what and so on. But over time, I think the ONDC model will be more cost effective because you will essentially... Uh, everybody, it's, you know, Adam Smith at work. Everybody's doing what he's good at. And they all work interoperably, so they, it'll it'll lower and it'll increase competition. So it'll definitely lower costs. And to what extent will uh, the people who use this system uh, be responsible, or the people who are selling on uh, ONDC be responsible for the goods that they sell? So I, I saw one kind of critical article about it, arguing that if I'm a consumer and I buy something on it, and I don't like the quality of it, um, who is responsible? Yeah. For that? So is I think it, that there's a whole set of protocols and rules being laid down on dispute resolution. And even that will be done online. So there's online dispute resolution. And there's also a cross-company reputation management system so that, you know, reputations on this network will be 
generated based on your activity or or your good behavior or bad behavior. So I think it's obviously complex. You know, nobody's done this before, so it'll take time. But even when you did payments, they said, "How can it work? How can you have two banks and two apps? And what if something goes wrong?" So that got sorted out. So I, I'm confident that this will also get sorted out. And how many merchants are on ONDC at the moment? I I don't know, but I know that one particular mobility app called Namayatri, which is in Bangalore, which provides mobility. Uh, does about 50,000 transactions a day. It has uh, over 100,000 drivers on it. Okay. Um, now, uh, you're responsible for uh, this kind of digital infrastructure. I'm, I'm not responsible. Well, I'm one no, of the but persons. we're responsible for building it, as it were, or um, designing it. Let, let's put it that way. I'm involved. Uh, I'm involved. That's... But um, you're operating in a market at, uh, where still only half of uh, India's people are on the internet. Um, and according to the IMF, I think only kind of 15% of rural households um, have ac internet access. Um, so there's, how do you um, uh, prevent a kind of big digital divide emerging in India between um, the people who do have access to these services? Yeah. I think overall there are about 700 million smartphones. But I think the key thing to think about it is that you can have self-service where you have a phone, which is the Western model, but you can also have assisted service where you can't afford the phone, but there'll be somebody in the village who operates a computer service center where you can go and access services. So for example, today you can withdraw money from any business correspondent in India using Aadhaar. They don't have a phone, they, but they have a bank account thanks to Jandan and Aadhaar, so they can withdraw money. So the, people are able to access digital services in an assisted mode where they go to a person who has a device on which they provide services. So we always think about how do we make sure these services are ubiquitous, not just for the people who have devices, but also for people who don't have devices. Yeah. Okay. Um, what next for the digital public infrastructure? I mean, what other areas are you going to build this in? I think there are two big ones which, which will go, which will, get, which will, I think, in the pipeline, which I think are very exciting. One is uh, the uh, account aggregator system, or what's called as data empowerment. Because we all know that digital uh, activity generates digital footprints. And then typically those digital footprints tend to get concentrated. Either the companies accumulate them and then sell you ads, or governments accumulate them and keep an eye on you, right? So this is what happens with data. But we have a model now in India where every individual and every business can use their own digital footprint to improve their lives. This is, this is a very profound idea of how, this, this is a big part of the Indian internet, is how do people use their own data? And that's getting rolled out in the financial service industry today, but tomorrow it can be rolled out in healthcare or any other sector. Now, what that does is, if I'm a small business today in India and I'm digitized my operations, I buy, th I buy things digitally, so I have invoices, I, I sell things digitally, so I have payment data, and I can now take that data and offer it to a lender who then on the basis of my business performance gives me credit. So this will lead to massive democratization of credit and allow millions of small businesses who so far could not get access to credit. So that leads to much more you know, economic growth everywhere, you know, leveling up, right? So, so that will actually happen on the ground. And similarly, consumers can use their digital footprint to get access to credit. So, so I think India will go from a, what's called as a prepaid economy, which is what the mobile industry invented, where I give money to get talk time, to a postpaid economy where everybody will get small doses of credit. And that will lead to much more balanced growth. That's one big thing in the next few years. The other big thing is uh, we're building something called Bhashini. The government of India has launched a Bhashini project to make AI for every Indian language, absolutely easy to use. And that's getting rolled out. And that will allow everyone to get access to every service in their own language spoken to them. So they don't need to use a keyboard or touch screen. They can talk and in their own language. And how are you doing that? What's the technology behind It's all using uh, the same, not, not the, using all these, uh, Machine le machine learning, not LLM so much, but using uh, technology similar to LLMs, transformers, 
And uh, right now at IIT Madras, they're the largest database of Indian language uh, data for all 22 major Indian languages. So that will suddenly make it transformational because people will get access to services in their own language. What about the area of education? A lot of people are thinking that this is an area that's right. For yes, your, that actually uh, has been work which we have, Roni, my wife and I have done in education through a foundation called Extep. We have built all the components for uh, education and those, uh, and they're all open sourced and they're all, that those components are being used in the Diksha program of the government. So the massive, uh, you know, rollout for teachers and so on. And now, of course, with AI coming in, that those kind of things will get double-charged. Uh, now, um, a lot of uh, countries around the world are figuring out how they can build a, a kind of more uh, purpose-oriented or kind of public service internet. Uh, to what extent are people elsewhere expressing an interest in what's going on in India and trying to copy parts of the, the in India stack that you've been developing? No, I think there's been a huge interest. Uh, uh, as uh, Vikram mentioned, it's one of the big themes of the a G20 presidency of India, digital public infrastructure. Uh, there are at least 40, 50 countries around the world who are looking at some aspect of it. Uh, and many of these technologies are available as open source. For example, the ID platform is available as an open source thing called MOSIP. And uh, nine countries are looking at implementing it. Two countries are like Morocco and Philippines. Between them have more than 100 million people on this ID platform. So I think, uh, and of course I talked about UPI. So I think over the next few years, a lot of countries will adopt some pieces of what we have. But doing the whole thing strategically will require a huge leap. It requires not only technological skills, it requires political commitment. And it, you know, as I said, this is not about money, it's about deep conviction. And I think in India, we have the advantage that the prime minister and his other leaders, like the finance minister and Amy, Mr. Jay Shankar, they all understand this and believe in it. And that gives you the confidence to go and roll it out in a big way. Um, now, you've mentioned a couple of times about AI, and uh, I'd like to ask you about this. Um, I mean, everyone um, is writing a lot uh, about AI and uh, ChatGPT in particular. I thought that actually the theory was supposed to be that ChatGPT was going to get rid of what humans were writing. But uh, in the meantime, we're writing about the technology rather than the other way around. Um, but what is your sense of this revolution? Is this just a kind of breakout moment in which a lot of people now understand the power of AI or has something fundamentally changed? I think both. I think this so-called generative AI using large language models is definitely a big leap forward in the, what AI can do from all the AI we've had. So that way it's a, genuinely a big leap. But also I think the the sort of the genius of open AI was to package that in a way that consumers could use it. And that's how they got to 100 million consumers in a month or two. So I think both it's a great consumer story as well as a genuine uh, technology story. In fact, Sam Altman is in India today. He's meeting the prime minister today. Must have met him today this afternoon. So I think uh, both are happening. And so it's an exciting time. And I think we are just at the beginning of this, but also think it's a wide open game. I, I don't think there are any winners yet. And in fact, there's a lot of open source AI coming. So even as you have ChatGPT from OpenAI and Microsoft, or you have Bard from Google, uh, you know Facebook has completely open sourced Llama, which is being used. So I think it's open yet. There's going to be uh, many, many people in this game. And I think the challenge in India will be, how do we use all this just to make things better for people? And how are you thinking about it, Infosys? Are you developing your own large language models? Or you, no, are we, we, we would just use uh, open source models and train them on uh, you know, data of the companies. And we think we'll get good enough results with that. We don't need to use some big uh, general AI. For, uh, so what's your best hunch about where, which areas will be most impacted by this? Well, I think business is, of course, a lot of business activity, business processing, all that will get automated. Customer service will have a, there'll be a big impact. Uh, I think uh, uh, the real thing is, I think rather than talk about replacing people, I would look at this as amplifying people's potential. So if every one of us has an AI assistant to make our job better, that's really what we need to aim for. So that's in the business side of it. In the other big thing is going to be in education. I think uh, 
you'll finally be able to look at personalized learning in a very, very, very intuitive way. So that particularly in India is a big thing because if you can get, everyone can have an AI tutor, then, you know, it's a different game. I was looking at some uh, Pew uh, opinion poll research uh, the other day, which showed that uh, people are a lot more concerned about AI in uh, Europe and the US uh, and a lot more positive about its uses in countries like India and China and uh, across Asia in particular. Uh, wh why is that, do you think? Is there more of an acceptance that this is... Yeah, I, I think, you know, thanks to all the things, you know, people who didn't have access to phones have got a phone, people have got a bank account, people are able to you know, make payments. Today, a vegetable vendor in India is able to sell for 10 rupees digitally and she, her productivity goes up. And at the end of the day, she's safer because the money is not physically with her. It's in a bank account, so nobody can extort it from her or rob her. So I think people have seen, and 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 you know, it's it's going to an ATM is far better than dealing with somebody who doesn't treat you well. So so I think there is a lot more acceptance of technology's positive aspects in India and countries like India, which is why I think they're more open to these things. Nonetheless, I mean, there have been, I think, uh, genuine um, kind of worries about the power of this technology, in particular in areas of kind of disinformation, um, also in terms of kind of... But how can that get worse? <laughs> uh, well, we'll see. Uh, in terms of kind of uh, economic dislocation and joking? job yeah. replacement. Um, and also, um, you know, if you believe some of the, the researchers recently in the, the kind of an existential risk, do you, do you believe in that? Well, I, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, we have we already have enough existential risk. We have the nuclear risk. We have climate change. So there's just one more of them in that sense. Uh, but I think uh, absolutely, I think we already have a massive problem of fake news, deep fakes, which will only become more with AI for sure. And there will be job changes. Many jobs are going to get removed, but new jobs will get created. But there's a time lag for that. So there could be some short-term dislocation for sure. But I think I would focus on if we can use it to improve healthcare for a billion people, or if we can use it to improve the learning outcomes for 200 million children. Those are really such huge upsides that that's what we should focus on. And obviously, you know, make sure that the downsides are protected against. Uh, the Prime Minister here, while he's been in America, has been calling for international regulation of AI and seeming to position himself as the, the champion of this, having written a white paper not so long ago, which said that we shouldn't regulate AI pretty much at all. Uh, but um, uh, w w what do you think of that? Is there a need to create an international atomic energy authority equivalent for AI to coordinate this on a global level or, and to steer off? Of well, I, I think it's, it may be a bit uh, premature for that. For one is not everybody's going to listen to you. So if, if there are countries that are building AI without your permission, then you can't do much about it. The second is that uh, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a period of rapid innovation that is happening today. And that requires permissionless innovation in some sense. So I think, I, I, certainly I think we have to figure out how to make sure that we minimize the harms of this. But I think at this point, it's more about uh, the innovation coming out. And we'll have to put in guardrails on this like anything else. Uh, there's one kind of final area I'd like to explore with you a bit before I open this up to the floor. But it's the uh, geopolitical environment in which um, this is all taking place. Uh, we now uh, have a real tensions between the US and China in particular on tech. Um, we've seen the whole kind of chip war uh, over semiconductors and so on. Um, India is a very important trading partner for both the US and China. In some respects, you're caught in the middle of this. In, in others, you made your position quite clear with um, China in particular um, by kind of banning TikTok that you were mentioning before and quite a few other Chinese apps. Where do you see India's position in this big geopolitical tech race? Well, I, th I think uh, India has a lot to offer in the tech world. In, 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 you know, essentially, Indian companies are building tech for the world. Uh, it's not so much a chip producer, so obviously we have to figure out how to do that. Uh, the good thing now is that hardware manufacturing is coming to India because many countries have realized they have too much concentration in one place, so there's a lot of uh, that happening, and India is benefiting from that. We're seeing lots of large global companies. So I think, obviously, it's a, 
it's a delicate thing and you know i'm not a diplomat so i don't want to get into some hot water here but, but i think it's you know you have to navigate through all this in a way that meets india's strategic interests uh, when i've been in india in the past um the people have often made the argument that um india is going to be the software power um in asia and china was going to be the hardware power and and as you're saying i mean india is now positioning itself as an alternative manufacturing center as you know apple or whoever wants to kind of diversify their manufacturing so do you think um india does have a real opportunity now to develop its uh, hardware sector oh absolutely you know i uh, i've been also waiting for it for a long time but now i feel it's for real uh, and i i have been uh, in just last a month back i went to visit uh, uh semiconductor uh, a mobile manufacturing and electronics manufacturing company in chennai i was simply amazed and blown by the sophistication they had it was as the same as their factory in gondong or whatever so so i think i think i'm much more because there's better infrastructure there's better you know uh, there's people skills are better and also the good thing about these companies are they're 100% women so suddenly you know the, in india one of the challenges has always been female participation in the labor force so i actually think that one of the significant byproducts of electronics manufacturing will be a significant uptake of women in uh, in in, empl- in employment all right great um so i'd like to open it up for questions i think we have a microphone yes um so the gentleman at the front thank you very much for really really can you just introduce yourself uh, my name is nash shift uh, i'm the policy lead for innovation technology for the city of london corporation uh, one of the things i'm looking at the moment is uh, leading to deliver a uh, corporate digitalization in the uk working with government i've got a much more spicy question for you as an answer for me uh no pun intended um so large language models depend on large language it's digitized india has 387 languages some larger some smaller of course but large language models the smaller languages just simply do not work well they are c extension the smaller languages in india actually that's one of the things that uh, this ai for bharat work which in fact we have supported at iit madras is looking at initially they will focus on the two major 22 major indian languages and they building the best data sets on these languages both oral and written and everything and then they're taking up many many of the long tail of languages that we have and building that so in some sense part of that project is actually to what you said that how do we make sure that we have the full diversity of languages that we have today i mean it is one of the stunning developments in ai isn't it i remember going to visit google quite a few years ago for um talking to people doing the google translate project and at that time i think um the kazakh government were very keen to have a kind of english language google translate and so they um had this big national campaign to get everyone in kazakhstan to translate english and kazakh language to provide the training data for the google translate algorithms now you wouldn't need to do that because you can create synthetic data or the algorithms have got so much smarter that you can have um translation between a lot kind of smaller data sets than you could in the past. Uh, we had a question over here. Have we got a microphone? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Uh hi firstly that was really fascinating. Thank you both uh, Mr. Nilikani and Mr. Sonil. I'm Sara Qureshi. I work at the High Commission. Uh John you touched upon uh the uh digital divide when it came to rural and urban households and I'd like to um extend that to the gender digital divide especially because um Nandan you spoke about how women's um you know employment prospects and all are really on a positive traje- trajectory so i just wanted to know how the dpi has in been in built checks and balances if any to uh, bridge this divide thank you i think dpi is about how and governments and policies are done to accelerate gender inclusion for example uh when i talked about the fact that india's bank accounts went from 20% to 80% they also went from a much more imbalanced one to where it's the same for men and women and then many of the government programs like the ujjala scheme and so on direct target directly money into the bank account of the woman so because of the id and bank account you can electronically credit money into the bank account without anyone coming in the way 
So that has been a huge driver. So there are many, these are all, I mean, these are all public policy things you have to do. But the infrastructure enables you to put a layer of gender inclusion on top of it. Um, there's a gentleman down here, and then we go over here. Um, Carlos Montes, Cambridge uh, Business School. Um, at, um, with J.D. Prabhu, we have been reviewing some of the work on, on digital infrastructure, um, and more from a world perspective rather than just India. And, and we, we, we call it like the silver bullet <laughs> for development, in the sense that it deals with some of the fundamental issues that every country addresses, like the informal sector and, you know, and all and all that, and it also adopts a bottom-up approach in the sense that it just facilitates people, you know, at the bottom to sort of like have an idea, you know, in Hernando de Soto's sort of understanding of the Arab Spring, you know, that people, you know, burn themselves because they couldn't trade, and this is what, you know, it, you make possible through your, you know, infrastructure. And um, the question, and you have answered a little bit that already, but it is, a bit to my surprise, because, you know, we were working in Ethiopia with the office of the prime minister, and, you know, we we're talking about these issues on how much, you know, because as you say, all this, you know, infrastructure is open. You have, you know, donated to the world as a way, you know, from India. And why is it that, you know, you think, you know, countries are not just running to say, let's just copy all this. You know, we don't need to do anything on innovation just to copy all this. You know, you mentioned political commitment, but what else do you think it's... it's yeah, I think political that? commitment and leadership that understands technology is very important. And and perhaps I think we have to do a better job in putting out... I mean, as you said, this is actually creating the ladder for people's aspirations. They get an ID which they never had. With that ID, they get a bank account. With that ID, they get a mobile connection. With that ID, they get a job. With that job, they get money in the bank. Then they have a digital footprint of their activities. Then they monetize that by getting a loan and so on. So actually it's a ladder of, and for a billion people, right? So that, that's what the power of this is. So I, I think perhaps we just need to do a better job of articulating this, but I, I and also, you know, what's happening is that, you know, we, the direct benefit transfer of money into people's accounts makes the de giving benefits efficient. And that was shown in the pandemic where India gave 160 million families real-time credit into the bank account as a, for that. Whereas in many societies, they took months and check payments and whatnot. And also it's very good for targeting. Again, you realize that here when there was the whole energy crisis, they had a big budget for energy subsidies, but they couldn't figure out how to give it only to people who needed it. So we can do that quite well in India. So there's the expenditure side of government. And then there's the revenue side of government, which is improving tax collections and all, which is also happening in India. India's tax to GDP ratio has been going up every year, which gives the government money to invest in infrastructure or benefits. And then there's the whole formalization grand bargain, which is that earlier people did not want to be in the formal economy because it was just too much bureaucracy and they have to pay taxes. Now, the onboarding of people into the formal economy has simplified because of all these things. And... Once you're in the formal economy, you can now trade your data to get access to credit and so on. Suddenly, there's a good reason to be in the formal economy. So there's a there's an overall, I, I mean, it, it, it sounds obvious, but I agree with you. I don't know why we are not able to communicate. Maybe you guys should be doing that. <laughs> yes. Coming from us, it sounds like the preaching, the converted are preaching, so. It's the lady here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heather Koverkus um, from Tech UK. Before I joined Tech UK, I worked in Commonwealth Secretariat, um, working on um, international development, particularly focusing on small economies and small countries. And they face a lot of the same challenges that India does, but on a very, very small scale. And so it's difficult to see you know, to sort of see yourself in India in some ways, the, the, the amount of people that had bank accounts that were able to just join because of it is like, you know, tens of times more than the population of some of these countries. And so I just wonder to what extent um, scale is a factor and whether or not smaller countries with similar challenges of, of people in remote areas what, that, that need this kind of access and services, whether it's too expensive to do it in a smaller place or whether or not scale isn't really a challenge and whether we can like take this example and just sort of 
just fit it into the context of a, of a smaller country? No, I, I think uh, it, it should not. It's, I don't think it's a scale. I mean, essentially what scale did was it forced us to create a very low cost, scalable architecture, which can be used by a smaller country at, at very low cost. So in, in that sense, what, what has happened is that the technology risk has been removed from these things because it, we have, it's, it's there. Really, now it comes to the the political issues, the the getting you know getting bureaucratic issues, silos, you know all that usual stuff that happens. It's it's overcoming that. That is always the challenge. It's never technology. Yes. Thank you. Hi, um, Amil Dasgupta. I'm a professor of finance at the London School of Economics. Um, I was really uh, interested to hear your idea of sort of how to convert India into more of a credit economy. By uh, right. as, as really uh, interested to hear your idea of, of how to convert into India into more of a credit economy by you know the sharing of transaction data um, by individuals and small firms. I think as as economists we worry a lot about sort of you know credible information sharing between sort of individuals and small businesses and banks. And this sounds like a, a really amazing idea. Um, in some sense, it's it's like open banking on steroids in some sense, the, the thing that's been being yeah. tried out here. My, my one thought was that in some sense, in the lead up to this competition or proliferation of like payment systems, right, is almost your enemy, right? Because what you need is like for one system to have all the transactions go through so that the full picture is available. And, and so in some sense, what's your view on, on that? You know, it, 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 do you think that that can happen? No, actually, I'm not sure you want to centralize all this data because there are other consequences of centralization. The way it works in India is in real time, I can talk to somebody and say, get my bank statement from bank X, get my utility bill payments from the utility company, get my insurance payments, get my tax returns in real time. And they will then give it to me signed and encrypted so that it can't be tampered with. And I can then direct it to go in real time to a lender and tell the lender, you can use this data only in these conditions. So we, it's qualified consent. You can use it only once, you can use it within a week. And to enable this, we have a traffic cop in between called an account aggregator, whose job is to act as the, pers the entity which provides this movement of data on your behalf. But because the data is encrypted, they can't see the data. So they can't fish around with the data. And these account aggregators are regulated entities who are licensed by the central bank. So it's a very, very strategic architecture at scale. Okay, question in the back here. Thank you. I'm Nick Coots. I'm a member of the Innovation Advisory Board of Unleash. And in Mysuru, on your campus, we created 220 solutions for the United Nations uh, SDGs, courtesy of your support. We had over 9,000 people apply from across India, and we took 1,000 candidates. But few startups survive. Something like 42% don't survive for more than 12 months. But we need startups to drive employment, particularly of young people. How do you see digital public infrastructure being used to support and, and to sustain startups? Yeah, I think the DPI plays a huge role in the startup economy. Uh, I think the startup movement in India is another sort of nonlinear change that has happened. In 2016, India had 1,000 startups. Today, we have 90,000 startups. So it's gone from 1,000 to 90,000. And you know, 20 years back, every kid coming out of IIT was on a plane to the US. Today, he's saying, I want to do a startup in Bangalore. So there's a fundamental mind shift change that has happened. And many of these companies have created uh, huge startups on top of this. I gave an example of PhonePay, which is owned by Walmart, but it was actually part of Flipkart. And it recently raised money at a $12 billion valuation. And that's entirely built on top of this infrastructure. And there are many, many companies like that. So I think the combination of this digital infrastructure at scale with thousands of startups actually then creates the magic of innovation. 
Hello. Thank you. I'm the founder and CEO of an eSIM global, global mobile network, and we're pioneering the digital infrastructure of the mobile core, transforming it with partnerships with large MNOs like Reliance Geo. But we're yet to see a lot of uptake in the eSIM technology in India. Um, and we believe that there could be a significant uh, improvement to Indian citizens for giving, by providing access to this type of technology. Have you explored anything relating to eSIM? No, or I do didn't you, understand. What does the technology do? Uh, eSIM technology. It's the electronic SIM card. So the ability to e download e -SIM, kind of. e SIM technology. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know the status of that. I'm sure it'll, it'll take off. But I don't know the current situation with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Karen McCluskey, and I'm the Emerging Technology Advisor to the Foreign Office. Um, I'm, thank you for today. I sort of understand a little bit better some of the decentralized aspects of the Indian stack. Could you help me understand further you, you've built with the stack an extraordinary mine of data. How do you unleash that power of the data to build the next AI economy? How can that be done? And indeed, is there a case for a sovereign LLM for India? It certainly, it certainly has the underpinning infrastructure to build it quickly. Thank you. Yeah. No, no actually, it's already being used. For example, if you look at the Aadhaar system, it does 80 million authentications a day. You can use your fingerprint, you can use your face, you can use your iris, you can use your OTP, you can use demographics. All the biometric authentications have a liveness detection test so that you don't fake it with photographs. That entire liveness de detection test is done with AI. Similarly, if you look at our tax system, both income tax and GST, a lot of compliance now is AI driven to catch fraud. And that's one of the reasons why India's tax collections have been going up. So you're actually seeing application of AI at very large scale already. And I think many of these data will then be, could form the basis for, uh, see, if it's about a, you know, domain specific LLMs. We use this data on standard LLMs and make it, uh, you know, that's, that's what is going to happen. For example, uh, what we have done is we have combined chat GPT with the language AI and ingested all farmer information into the system so that a farmer in Hindi can ask a question and get an answer in real time. So this is how you mix and match these things to create solutions. Okay. okay. Hi, yeah, good. Yeah. Hi, good evening. This is Kamal Jain from IIM Bangalore and I currently work with the British Telecom. Uh, thank you for uh, inspiring session on the technology. I have uh, just one question. So while we talk about AI, so do we have any project that, uh, you know, how can we leverage AI to reduce corruption in the society or reduce the crime into the society? Like if you see Dubai, so, you know, like they have been like uh, leveraging AI to reduce the crime to almost zero. Well, you know, if you look at what's happening on the tax system of India, both our indirect tax and direct tax use AI to catch fraud and reduce, uh, you know, tax evasion. So that's one example. Similarly, when you do direct benefit transfer, the money goes directly into your bank account and you can go to any location in the country and withdraw it. So that reduces corruption in the last mile of benefit delivery. So there are many, many things like this which reduce corruption in different areas. Hi, um, thank you so much for this talk, Mr. Nilekani. My name is Suyesh and I am uh, running a couple of businesses in Cambridge, one of which is related to um, serving schools and uh, children in, in the rural community in India. So we, by the end of this year, we are going to reach uh, almost 100,000 students, not only in the urban, but also in the rural. So my, my question is regarding um, that, like how technology this can be leveraged for companies like us. We are bringing the quality of University of Cambridge and our aim is to bring that quality to the rural schools, not only to the urban communities. And so far, the way it works in India is that there are companies like Baiju's that sell these, these sort of platforms to um, to urban uh, cities, then there are companies that sell solutions to the government. The government can incentivize their schools. But for companies like us, which are trying to uh, 
provide you know quality education yeah, sure. software how how yeah. will that so actually be? now india has uh, put out something called ndr which is a national digital architecture where private companies can bring their content on top of the the rails just like upi rails the education rails just to give an idea india has printed 600 million textbooks a year and every textbook has qr coded the topics in it it's average of 20 topics per te textbook there are 12 billion qr codes right now which are readable by a phone anywhere in india so you can use that framework and if you have some superior content you can provide it with this framework absolutely hi uh, my name is shweta i work with deutsche bank as a global transformation manager and i started my career actually with infosys almost 20 years back so it's really really good to see you over here uh, my question is around how are you ensuring or rather the dpi ensuring uh, the sanctity of the ids so cybersecurity is a key issue right when we are talking about aadhaar and also looking at aadhaar actually uh, looking at all of the other banking systems all payment systems your uh, tax transactions etc so how are we ensuring that the cyber security and the sanctity of the id is yeah, I mean, it's a larger topic but fundamentally the id only is uh, to verify that you are the person you claim to be and it has to be done with an authentication and that authentication has to be either a biometric authentication or OTP to your registered phone. And every transaction needs two-factor authentication. And the number of things, I don't want to get all that, but but a lot of things have been done with cybersecurity in mind. But we always have to be very careful. I agree with you. I'm sorry? Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, great. No. No, actually, what, what will happen with UPI is uh, currently you have bank accounts, everybody operates on the bank account. And you're right, the government said no revenue on that. But at the bottom end, they're going to have offline wallets on UPI. So then it's it doesn't go to the bank. You have a wallet in your phone and it deducts from that. So then the bank doesn't have any cost there. And the upper end of the transactions will be credit card based where they will make money. So now with credit card on UPI or credit on UPI, you will now have revenue models coming, which are credit based, but not for the core uh, debit credit, but for giving loans. Right. Uh, two final questions over here from the and the lady. And then, then uh, David Eves from University College London and CoDevelop. Um, you've talked a lot about how DPIs are shifting markets and creating kind of new opportunities to build on top of them. I kind of want to talk more about the public sector. But I think actually one of the most interesting things about DPI is it's not just the technology. It's a it's a way of thinking around using interoperability to link things together. And governments are used to being quite siloed. So I'm curious, are the DPIs that you've created in India causing the Indian government to think differently about how it should be doing everything it does as opposed to just this layer of infrastructure? That I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right that we, from day one, we thought of these infrastructures as horizontal in nature which were open access to all departments. So for example, the direct benefit transfer is a plumbing pipe, which has an ID and a bank account and a way to withdraw money. And whether it's a pension done by the pension department or a scholarship by the education ministry or something else, they just build on this pipe. Similarly, the EKYC is used by all the regulators. So the thing is build an infrastructure which is horizontal and then convince everyone to use it. And then over time, that's how you do it. There's no, there's no shortcuts on these things. Oh, yes. It's um, Stephen Bryan from the Legatum Institute. I just want to pick up on a question we had earlier about sort of small nations and ask what's stopping this service simply becoming internationalized? 
So, you know, DPI as a service. So it's not having to have different instantiations in different countries, but simply global citizens can create global identities, trade with each other, and then it's simply up to governments to recognize what's already extant rather than building an Ethiopian or a, you know, a, a Ghanaian yeah. version of it. You could do that. and uh, But the thing is, ID has always been a sensitive sovereign issue because IDs has got commingled with other purposes. So citizenship is an ID plus it says that you're a citizen of country X. A driver's license is an ID plus it allows you to drive and so on and so forth. So the idea that ID is just a foundational ID that says John is John, that's a bit too much for people to handle. So, but you're right. If you create a foundational ID, then there's no sovereignty involved. You're just confirming that the person is who he or she claims, and then you can layer on that citizenship or whatever it is. So getting people to say that this is not a sovereign issue is really, the, it's a mental block. All right. I fear that we must end it there, but uh, thank you very much to the audience for some great questions. <laughs> and, um... And thank you very much, Nandan, uh, for a wonderful talk. I mean, I think um, whenever you go to Silicon Valley, there's a sense of technological determinism that technology is going to drive us in this one particular uh, vision for the future. And I think as you've uh, kind of wonderfully explained this evening, there is an alternative vision, many alternative visions. Uh, and I think you know, the idea of a kind of fifth internet, a different way of doing things has come through really powerfully this evening. And thank you very much to His Excellency for hosting us this evening. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.